Um, good afternoon. I'm Phil Gallagher and I work for London Underground. Joined as a quick two-week fill-in job, as many people do on the railways, 31 years ago now. Um, currently my job is within a department called the Track Delivery Unit, where one of the things we do, or the main thing we do really, is deep track renewals. So that's an upgrade of the tube tunnels throughout London. That's not all we do. We currently put over a thousand men a night out in engineering hours across London, not just in the tube, but across subsurface and open section parts of the network as well, doing all sorts of upgrades across the system. We're also doing, someone mentioned the RAMS project, which is all about improving reliability across the London Underground network. We're also managing rail grinding machines, so I've got articulated lorries now running around the underground lines at night milling rails, for instance. There's different things we do. Like I say, deep tube is just one. Today, <clears throat> I've been asked to talk through the various headings you see on the board. I'm not going to read it out word for word. So the next round about 30 minutes, we'll be going through some slides looking at those topics there. Again, questions, if you want to ask a question as you go, Feel free, I don't mind taking questions, but I'm a bit conscious of time. We have to keep it quite snappy as we go. So, to start off with, planning. <clears throat> as Tom said, we got to start out right at the very uh, concept of what we're doing with an end game. Why are we doing something on the railway? Why do we need to do it? So we produce a document called a technical requirement specification. So the question is, why do we want to go and upgrade something on the underground? Is it because there's an opportunity to increase speed, to give us more trains per hour through a certain sets in the track so we can get more people around? Because we definitely do need to move more people through London. We might have some speed restrictions applied to the track because we could have some clearance infringements. So we want to improve the geometry. Platform train interface was mentioned. We're now putting lots of humps on platforms, trying to put level access so people can get on and off the trains without great big steps. Or it could be that an asset has reached the end of its natural life. It does need to be upgraded because to maintain it is no longer cost effective. So we initially produce a technical requirements specification. And the people we get involved in that are all the stakeholder groups. There's the man in the back row up there who holds the money, the track sponsor. So within London Underground, we have the capital funding. And how we spend it is dependent upon why we want to do the work. We include the maintainers. Why do they want the work done? So all our stakeholders throughout the business get consulted at the outset, all get the opportunity to put their input into the pot and we come up with an outline methodology for doing the work, and we produce an outline program of how we could deliver it. We work with our design team. They don't, in isolation, go away and do a design. The design team talk to the people that are going to build the job, and the people then afterwards who are going to maintain it. So within London Underground, we have the integration that everybody talks to each other. We've knocked the silos down, we try to work together to implement what is the best solution for London across the network. Is the picture clear on the screen? I can't really tell from here. It's pretty clear. Okay. Um, we also produce an outline. This is what we think we're going to need time-wise to build it, depending upon what access we're going to use. Have we got a possession, a blockade? Have we got engineering hours access? We need to know this in order to be able to cost it, program it, plan it from start to finish. And again, we produce the estimate of what the job will cost to be delivered. We commission the designs. We go out, we undertake site surveys. When we undertake the site surveys, we do look for assets from other departments other than track on the, that are going to cause us problems. So we've got cables running across the track. If we're renewing the track, we may not be renewing the cables. So either we have to remove the cables for the duration of the work, or we have to protect them. Some cables we're not able to remove. Not all the cables are visible like this. So if we go out and do a survey, 
we'll highlight them with cans of white spray, yellow spray, or any other colour we've got. But what you'll find on the underground, we have an awful lot of cables run down the side of the track. You should be able to see here, they disappear into the side of the tunnel. My estimation is they then run through the concrete under the track. So if my team then come out at night and they get their concrete breaking equipment out, one, we're putting people at risk if they are live cables. Two, we break live cables, which might be controlling the, the entire signalling asset. So we stop things. We hurt people. So we go through <coughs> dilapidation surveys, all sorts of surveys, to actually understand what could be a risk to deliver. <coughs> and we highlight those risks at an early stage. When it comes time to go near site, we'll produce the project documentation. Safe systems of work, method statements. Project pathway was mentioned. So London Underground follow a project management framework called Pathway, which has hundreds of what we call products, or we call them documents as well. And it's about the rules of how we work and deliver the projects. When we feel like we're ready to go, as in start on site, to the agreed timelines, project assurance checks are made to ensure that, yes, the design fits, the methodology fits, the safe system will work, get all the ticks in the boxes before we go out on site. London Underground, though, being the system that it is, we're an urban railway. And the part I'm talking about today is all under the streets of London. So how do we actually get the access? We run the services. We don't have the luxury of local lines, fast lines, main lines, ten sidings. We're lucky if we've got one road going north and one road going south. It's closed at night from around about half past one till half four, five o'clock in the morning. During those times, we have to go in each night, mobilise through station entrances such as this. Station entrances are designed to let people in and out. They're not designed for us to carry heavy equipment through. We have issues on occasion where at the side of the gate lines, sometimes there's a glass barrier. So we take, tend to take the bigger bits of equipment through the glass barriers. Generators, track trolley, iron men, materials, and glass. Do they go together? Or does one give way? <coughs> we, we do have to protect our assets. And you know, if we do damage anything on a station, can that station then open to passenger service the following morning? So we have to be very mindful of how we get in, how we get out. But the working window, it's very small. We're lucky to get two to three hours work per night in places, especially in the central area, central London, where we have the deep tubes. In an average night, we're lucky if a gang of up to 18 men can change three to four sleepers, and that'll be their night's work, changing three to four sleepers. But those sleepers are all set in concrete. So they have to go in, remove the existing concrete, remove the sleepers, and put new concrete in. And that concrete's got to be gone off by the time the first train comes along. Saturday night, we get a little bit of extra time because on Sunday morning, nobody wants to go anywhere on a Sunday morning. Everybody stayed in bed. So the train service starts up that little bit later on a Sunday morning, giving us that little bit extra time. So the Saturday nights are very, very valuable to us when it comes to actually delivery of our works. We can get higher output, more productivity more access to the time on track. But more importantly, <coughs> whatever we do, we want to ensure that we don't interfere with the very first train that runs the next morning. It's all about protecting service, allowing the train service to run <coughs> to its timetable. So what we tend to do on a Saturday night, the higher risk activities, we try, if we can, to defer some of those to a Saturday night where we've got that little bit extra time and there's also, like I say, fewer people who would be effective if, if it did go wrong on a Sunday morning. Saturday nights, though, London Underground is going to be a 24-hour railway come September 2015. That has been decided. So my Friday night engineering hours, gone. My Saturday night engineering hours, gone. 
my extended period of time to do those high risk activities gone. <coughs> so I've got to look now for new ways to deliver the same work because the work has to continue. Weekend possessions, blockades, they're not favoured on the underground. Like I say, we haven't got the luxury of relief lines. We've got one north, one south. That's it. So closing a line, the service is gone. With the 24-hour railway as well, our access to weekend um, engineering hours, blockades, is diminishing. So our whole way of working is changing. Access to engineering fleets as well. The London Underground system does have its own, some would say, quite aged fleet of engineering trains. And everybody wants them. I want them to get my materials to site as a renewals person. My friend Paul there in the middle, he wants them to get his maintenance materials to site. The, the upgrade projects and put new signalling systems in, they want them because they want to go and run new cables down the tunnels. Everybody wants the engineering trains. There's not enough to go around. So what I've just shown here is a bit of innovative use of a train. Oops, sorry, wrong button. This was one of the old Victoria Line trains. So we've now got what we call 09 stock running on the Victoria Line. But as they were going off to be scrapped, we managed to grease a few palms within the company and we diverted them on a couple of blockades we had. So this particular one, on a Friday night, it went onto the Victoria Line and parked up in the station and opened its doors. Over the course of the Saturday and the Sunday, my staff filled it with passengers. Can you see the passengers on the seats and at the ends? We had a load of scrap rail to get rid of on the Northern line, uh, Victoria Line. <coughs> Couldn't get engineers trains to get it out. So this train, and others like it, <coughs> We filled it full of scrap rail. We cut the rail short and we filled the train. On the Monday morning, or the end of engineering hours of the possession at the weekend, the train then drove off of the Victoria Line down to Acton Works and then it was loaded carriage by carriage onto the back of low loader lorries and taken <coughs> to the scrap merchants. That's the sort of ways we have to work to get rid of some of the redundant materials on the underground. Access and constraints via stations. <coughs> nice little picture I found on one of my sites. Anyone guess the location? Regent Street, Piccadilly Circus. So that's Piccadilly. Eros is just round to the right there. So we're coming up. That's Piccadilly Circus Station, just there. So this is how we get our materials most of the time into stations. We bring a lorry load along. This particular one showing a lorry of wooden sleepers, offload onto the pavement, and then manually, manhandle, through the station, lifts, escalators, stairs, down to platform level. This lot were going to the Bakerloo line. So if you know the station, you know how you've got to get down to the Bakerloo line. So it's stairs, it's escalators. Christmas time, we get a lot of well wishes at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't need to go into that one, do I? You know where I'm coming from. They want to come in and help us and get on the train that's just sitting down there. Yeah? Anyone been that well wisher? <laughs> but access is problem, problematic to us. We haven't got the luxury of great big storage areas, great big wide ways. Everything is compact when it comes to London Underground. Before we go through any station, one thing we make sure we do is a dilapidation survey of that station. It avoids that, the finger pointing. So my teams, every station we're going to access, we go around with cameras. And we take the walking routes that we're going to be using through those stations. And if it looks cracked, scratched, bent, whatever, we take photographs of it put it into a document and we get it agreed up front with the landlords, the GSMs of the stations, we didn't do this. 
it just saves the arguments. But the one thing we do suffer with is glass barriers. And if you've got an Iron Man or a track trolley, you know the great big advertising hoardings you see on the walls, the nice digital, you know, like 56 inch screens? Don't lean track trolleys on them either. It doesn't work. So, access is a big issue to us. So, we have to be innovative. One of the ways we've done that recently, St. Paul's Station. We were using St. Paul's as access. Again, lots of stairs, lots of escalators to get up and down. Lots of potential damage that we could do to these assets. If we damage, if we drop something on an escalator, it's quite simple. No escalators, no station until it's fixed. So we've been looking for ways to try and <coughs> decrease our reliance on the assets that are there for the passengers to use, customers. So at St. Paul's, there is a part of the station that is actually disused. It goes back nearly 100 years. There is an old lift shaft. So this building, oops, wrong button, sorry. This building here with the clock tower, which was another issue, by the way. Underneath it, there is a disused lift shaft that God knows how many years ago used to have a lift service down to St. Paul's platforms, which is now a disused part of the station. There's a new station built. So what we've done is we've looked at, can we utilise that space? It, you know, it goes down to the track level, just platform level. And we've worked with some companies throughout Europe. And you know the hoist you get on the side of skyscrapers now that are going up? You get these red or silver hoists that run up the side on tracks. We've put one of those in, inside the disused lift shaft. One thing we didn't find out until we were actually installing it, though, is when the lift shaft was built, the lift didn't drop vertically. It was a slight uh, miscalculation by the Victorians or the people who built it in the first place. But, yeah, and, but even the companies that we worked with to actually build this lift, they've only ever made them for going up. So they've always been designed for building skyscrapers from floor up. We've actually done it the other way around now. We put the load in at the top and we take it down. It caused a few eyebrows to be raised by the actual companies that helped us along with this project and supplied the lifts. But basically what you've got there now at street level, it's a traffic island near St. Paul's Station. So we've worked with the council, we've worked with the Barclays Forest Bike Hire Scheme, because they've plonked a load of bikes on the island as well. And we've now built a compound. And in that compound, we've now got mechanisation. So articulated lorries now, from about 8 o'clock onwards at night, turn up, loaded with materials that we need. We have forklift trucks to unload those lorries. You can just about see the end of one of the, it's a two-level hoist we've got. It's one of the cages there. We've marked walkways, we've put hacky tower staircases in, going up to street <coughs> level. And we've got forklifts that are operating underground as well. So we've taken all the manual handling. So the picture before, Piccadilly Circus, sleepers come off at street level. We then go through the station without causing any damage, because we don't like doing that. We've taken it away. No more manual handling. And now at platform level. So you've got the forklift truck operating in the disused part of the station. And when we get to the area where the forklift can't work, we've now put conveyor belts in. So we're delivering the materials on conveyor belts right to the edge of the platform. So the only manual handling we have now is from there onto the trolleys to distribute materials to our work sites. And as well as getting materials in at St. Paul's, what we've done as well, we've started using motorised carts. So we're actually spreading the materials through a wider area on the underground. So Liverpool Street, we used to take lots of materials into Liverpool Street. <coughs> Us and about 20 other contractors. Hundreds of people, literally, every night turn up at Liverpool Street Station to do work on that particular station of one asset group or another. We've moved our stuff away. So the reliance on the assets that happens at Liverpool Street, if they break, it's not going to be my fault anymore, which is a big 
plus. But we're now we've got distribution teams working on the eastbound and the westbound roads. So we're using that St. Paul's hoist system as a hub, a distribution centre. <coughs> so the materials go in, goes onto motorised carts, and they go east and west of that station. <coughs> and they supply numerous sites down the line. There's a lot of work going on there. So it was worth you know, actually investing in that hoist system in the first place. Sort of stuff we store underground. <coughs> We're lucky in some places that we do have storage underground. CP, it's just a nickname because it's a cross passage. So all our tun tunnels, north and south, east and west, they have ventilation relief shafts. So the big plugger there goes in front of our trains with such a tight fit in the tube. These shafts allow the air to dissipate. But what we do is we block that air dissipation, is the best way of putting it, by filling the <laughs> with materials. Yeah. So there's a load of sleepers there, concrete sleepers. This stuff here, this is bagged concrete. So we utilise what space we have, but we don't always have space in tunnels. If we have got it, we make use of it. <coughs> Setting out, survey, design, important to us. Alison might recognise that top right hand picture yeah, from a few years ago. Um, three dimensional laser tunnel sweeps. We, we use various means of looking after our tunnels and understanding the shape and size of our tunnels. We need that so that when we do come to do a renewal, we can actually get the best geometry, the best out of what that asset is. So one of the ways of doing it is, yes, we'll, we'll go and do a laser sweep. We have some other, this is a full 360 system there, but we have others that just do slices rather than the whole tunnel as well. But when we build, We'll set the actual tunnel out using total station 3D equipment. But a lot of the time we build using a stick. So this, these spigots in the wall, they're set to 0.1 or they're about to a millimetre accuracy. And you put prisms on and you throw your lasers off of them. But we use rules, for want of a better description, and spirit level bubbles still to actually build the tube these days. Gives us a little bit of room for error, which, again, we don't like. So three-dimensional is the way forward. Accuracy is everything in this job. Type of equipment that we use. Well, this picture could really have been taken last night, couldn't it? For those that know the tube. But the man from Health and Safety is looking, so I can say definitely it wasn't taken last night. Because if it was, they'd all be in high-vis, and wearing hard hats. Those tools there, see? Oh, and one other thing. These electric tools they're using, which are not insulated, of course, they wouldn't be powered off the two 630 volts <laughs> DC conductor rails. But we still use the same tools, but they're just powered slightly differently these days. <laughs> this is a picture of my wall in my office, by the way. <laughs> One of many. Um, yeah, it's just types of tools we use. Like I say, look at, looking at the picture though, that could be any tunnel on London Underground. And it could be taken last night apart from the health and safety implications. <clears throat> These days we do tend to use electricity to power the tools underground. We do, however, still use air, compressed air. But what that means is I have to put an air compressor into a station. How do I get an air compressor down an escalator? I can't. So I've got to get one of those yellow trains that I can never get, purely to drop back onto a platform. I've then got a big power supply I've got to feed because it's all you know, heavy duty 415 AC feeds. We then run power as in pipes all the way through. So engineering hours comes underneath the edge of the platform there, there'll be a valve we click onto. After the station closes, the last passenger's gone, we'll run a bit of pipe from the compressor along the platform and connect it to the pipe line which is fixed, fixed underneath the platform edge. 
and it runs for hundreds of metres or even a couple of kilometres into the tunnel <coughs> to give us power supply for breakers and you know, impact wrenches or scabbling devices. So what we're tending to do these days is we're moving rapidly away from air and we're going primarily towards 110 volt supply. All of our tunnels these days do have 110 volt supply boxes in them, split every 20 odd <coughs> meters down the track. But when the system was put in, it was put in for emergency use only. It's a very light duty supply. But we've been working with our colleagues on the power side and we've redesigned the outputs. So we're actually getting a lot more power in the tunnels now. And one of the benefits for the maintainer is we're not taking them out when we've done the work in areas we've been, we're gonna leave them there for future use. Because the light duty stuff that's in there, if you put two breakers on the same box, you keep popping fuses all the time. So the last thing you want when you're actually doing some work on the track, where you've got two hours to break out, renew, and re-pour your concrete, is when you start to put your concrete mixer in, it blows the fuse. What do you do? So. <clears throat> Some of the bigger tools that we do use. One here on the left. It's a pecker. It's a breaker for removing concrete. As you can see, that's a large bit of kit. Can we store that in the tunnel? Nine times out of 10? No, nowhere to put it. Can we put it into a bolt hole? As in one of those cross passages in the tunnels. Nine times out of 10, we can't get them in because the cross passages are usually not, you know, you've got two running tunnels. Sometimes the tunnels are like that. And when you get the vent relief shafts, they run at angles. So if I put that bit of kit into one of those tunnels, the trains go dry, they vibrate, what's going to happen to the stuff I store in that shaft? Have we ever had that on the underground when things have fallen out of a... Uh, yeah? We try to learn from, hopefully, touch wood, other people's learning experiences. Some people call them mistakes, I call them learning experiences. <clears throat> but health and safety is another thing that's important to us. You can see here, I've got a man, and his job on that particular night is to stand there with a, you know the old car paint sprayers? Spray gun, that's what it is. But he's not spraying paint, he's spraying water in the air. Dust suppression. In these tunnels, at night time, there's very, very little moving air. Any dust that we create just stays in the air. <coughs> so, Break, yeah, breaking out concrete. So we use these, Brock is the main brand that we use. There's different sizes of the machine. We tend to go for the smaller end of the spectrum, purely to get them in and out every night. But a lot of the time, we'll actually store these on the platforms. So if you're on a tube station and you see a little blue hoarding along the platform at one end, you might have something like that hiding behind it. Then at night time, we'll open the doors and wheel it out and down onto the track. Um, again, other pictures showing breakout. Again, I've got my man here with his water jet spray. All about dust suppression. We've got to control the dust we release. The temperature in these tunnels at night, anyone know? What these workers are working under temperature-wise? 30, 40 degrees. That's where you are. That's the, that's the air temperature. And we make them wear lots of Cotton wool, don't we? On top to keep them safe. Yeah. So we have endless supply of bottled, bottled water going out to sites. So dehydration, all this sort of stuff is very important. We monitor it all the way through. And again, in the bottom picture here again. There's my man's hand spraying, spray, spray, spray. That's what we have to do all the time. <coughs> materials. Quick look at materials. We hate wood. That's the only way of putting it, really. Wood is the bane in our life at this moment in time. We used to buy all of our wood from a little country called Australia. Yeah, so we used to have the Salanga Batu and the Jarro and all the other stuff that we used to use years and years ago. No more. Tasmania has been bled dry. Rainforests have receded as far as we can take them. 
We now buy our sustainable hardwood from Brazil. The problem is, it's nothing like the timber we used to get. It comes over to us, it's extremely green. It is full of moisture. We put it into the track, into our 35 to 40 degree tunnels. We then fan it to keep that air going through that timber, as you would expect it to do as it seasons with our trains, 200 odd times a day. And it shrinks. It dries out. We end up with our timber set in concrete, but we end up with gaps around it. As soon as you start getting the gaps around it, you're losing your support. Things start to think about moving. As soon as it starts to move, the concrete starts to crack. We end up going into a vicious circle. Me, as an installer, am I going to be able to hand a new bit of track that I've just put in that's all nice and pristine back to the maintainers? You're going to want to take it off me, knowing full well in three months' time there's one of them right in the middle there with a big smile on his face. Yeah? Is he going to want to take it off me? Because it's going to give him a maintenance nightmare. So wood is the bane of our life at this moment in time. And we're looking at ways of eliminating wood from our railway. And we'll come on to that in a moment. So, renewing pit blocks in the station ground. We'll go in and break out those nasty looking, looking wooden pit blocks over here. We'll break them out with our concrete breakers. And this is what you end up with, a rail free hanging. We'll hang our new concrete pit blocks on. This is just one method that we're using, and currently we're looking at going away from this as well. Because we're now looking at trying to eliminate some of the concrete products on the railway. And then we have to cast concrete around the entire section before the first train comes through. So, we've also got the conductor rail to support. Very innovative. Use a cable tie to hold it all together. It works. When we're pouring concrete as well, to protect the, the pandrel housings and the clips that are in there, what do we do? How do we do it? Shower caps. Yeah, you know, you go to these hotels and you get the complimentary shower caps. If you don't want them, bring them, we'll use them. Okay. But that's what we use. We'll put a disposable shower cap over that assembly to protect it from concrete. It saves us having to clean it all and take stuff away afterwards. We then put some shuttering up, which is strutted off the adjacent road. We do one side at a night. We do one side, then we go and do the other side. We use gauging bars, we get the top and the alignment correct. When it's all in the correct position, we fill that void with concrete. So all the concrete there is broken out in one night. The wooden pit blocks, the support for the rail, the base plates, are all taken away. We hang the new blocks in place with its fixings. Put the shuttering up, gauge in the line, and pour concrete. All in two to three hours, depending on where you are in central London. Right, so concrete, how long does it take to set? Can I run my train service in the morning over wet concrete. We have to ensure that by the time the first train goes over that track, 15 kilonewtons strength in the concrete is an absolute minimum. Now, we've got uh, lots of recipes for concrete that we use. Very quick acting, quick, very quick drying, curing. They generate lots of heat. So over 35, 40 degrees, we actually radiate heat at the men as well through the concrete. And you can get burns off it. It's that hot. It's well over 100 degrees. In the tunnel sections themselves, sleepers. So we use concrete sleepers. The advantage of concrete sleepers is we actually mount the conductor rails, the negative conductor rails, on the end of the concrete sleeper. But if you notice what you would mostly would call the fourth rail, we actually have the mounting between the concrete sleepers. <coughs> what you can see here, this is the ribs, the rings of the tunnel. We don't have space. Our tunnels are very small. So a standard length sleeper, 2.6 metres, these don't fit. These are less than 2 metres, these sleepers we put in. There's nowhere for the conductor rail to go. So we have to 
cast it onto its own little concrete block on the edge of the tunnel. Shingle, well, down the center of the tunnel, we put all this shingle in. Why do we want drains in our tube tunnels? It's underground. It's not going to rain in there, is it? Why do we need drainage? Sea pitch. Mm. You say our tunnels leak. <laughs> do our tunnels leak? Just a bit. The current water feature on the underground is at Mile End. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's actually a little permanent. I suggested the little picture of the boy. You know, we could <laughs> get a little statue and put it in down there. But what's up, Sue? So Sue bakes nice cakes. If anybody wants to know, <laughs> if you don't know Sue, just you find her on Facebook. And in 172 Buckingham Palace Road, she bakes nice cakes, but not for me. Right, so our tunnels do on occasion leak like sieves. So we have to have means for water to escape the tunnels. So the central section in here, there's a void underneath there, cast into the concrete, and we fill it full of shingle. Do we need to fill it full of shingle? What's the shingle for? People to walk on it. But our maintenance staff, they can jump between them. We're not worried about them, are we? Or are they not the people we're talking about? Well, it helps them and it helps evacuation. Oh, evacuation. Anyone been involved in one of those on the underground? Yeah? They're great fun. You're told you've got to get off the front of the train and walk down the tunnel. Yeah, they're great fun. That's what the shingle's for. It's a walkway. It's infilled purely for a walkway, but it allows the water to flow through. This could be last night virtually as well. Apart from the fact, I don't know if you can see it, in the background, there's actually a train there. So we used to, in the old, old days, when we could get the trains, put the concrete mix on the back. There's a bell mixer on the back of the train there, and we used to pour it out. And days are well and truly gone. But we'll go through that in a second. That's how we do it these days. We mix our concrete in a bucket. But, it's not any old concrete, very, very special concrete we use. It will go off within five minutes of mixing it in our tunnels. However, if it's in the middle of winter and you're in a tunnel by a portal, it won't go off within five minutes, <laughs> or maybe not even five hours. It's very, very affected by the ambient temperature around it. It's designed to work at 20 degrees. At 20 degrees, it's got a working life of 15 minutes. Our tunnels are nearer 35 to 40. So as soon as it's mixed, it's in the ground. You have to do it very, very quickly. That you can see is where a wooden sleeper was. We call this popping. And on this particular occasion, we've installed a concrete sleeper. Methodologies of work, the process of build, it all depends. Are we doing it engineering hours? Are we doing it in a weekend blockade and possession? So if I get a blockade, I'll do things differently. I'll rip the life out of the railway. But in engineering hours, we've got to do it bit by bit by bit. I'm not going to read all that out. As I said earlier on, you're going to get all these slides as a handout, so I'll be wasting your time and mine. Shingle removal, yeah, that's what we do. If we do remove it, we have to install boards to maintain that, walk, that walkway on what we call the light side of the tunnel. It's where we've got lights all down the tunnels for emergency evacuations. <coughs> Health and safety issues? Well, we have very confined working space. Again, not last night, because he's smoking that bloke there. Outrageous. <coughs> Probably booked on in a pub as well somewhere. <coughs> um, in the actual tunnels themselves, we have very few mechanized lifting aids. We are reliant upon people working as teams, highly skilled at working as teams. I'm glad to say in my particular department, we put out over a thousand men a night, and that's not an exaggeration. We usually operate around 60 to 70 work sites a night, so it's 20 on on the average. And it's very, on very few occasions, we actually have a staff injury. Our safety record over the last three years has been getting better and better and better. But saying that, 10 days ago, a chap was lifting a track jack off the edge of the platform, lost control of it, and it landed on his metatarsal bone, which is the Wayne Rooney foot, yeah? So 
that we managed to crack a metatarsal 10 days ago. But it's very rare we have any injuries these days because we do insist on the people working as teams. A lot of effort goes into our risk assessment process as well. Fed up with the shingle. It costs us a lot of money to dig it up, put it back. That's our solution. When we set the shuttering up, what we do now, cast a little recess. So basically on the edge of the shutter, we put a bit of 50 by 50 wood and nail it on. It was that shelf when we cast the concrete. And we use GRP sheets now. Gives you the level walking surface. So no size, drop them in. Very light to manipulate and handle into the actual tube. We drop them under and they're secured with little clips as well so they won't get drawn up by trains. Some of the innovations we're doing, I said we're trying to get rid of concrete products. We're looking at direct fix. So rather than getting a concrete block in the pit and putting that concrete block in the pit, okay, we'll have concrete, yes, but let's actually put the base plate on. So we'll actually put the base plate in. We're doing away with a lot of products. We're doing away with a lot of joins in the concrete. So we'll have one concrete surface. The fixings here, these all have been engineered to give us the correct required grip within that concrete structure. Also, I don't know if you can see it or not, these are resilient base plates. These are Delcors. We buy them from an Australian company who manufactures them in China. It takes us 12 weeks to ship them over by the container load. Resilient base plates, there's a layer of rubber in there which allows us to actually control some of the vibration that goes into the ground. We've currently got them for plane line track. We're trying now to actually develop one we can use in check rails. But I think there's someone was saying in the audience, the size of the footprint of the check rail is rather <coughs> massive. So we're trying to do the engineering required at the moment to give us a suitable base plate. This is just showing you where they've gone in. You can see we've got some temporary sleepers in. So when we are renewing the track, this bit here, you can see it's being renewed. This bit was a bit older. We use these temporary sleepers, we call them one in fours, one in fives. And what they actually do, that's the first thing we do with a pit on the existing track we're going to do. We actually go and put these sleepers in and they give us the correct gauge and inclination of the rail. It allows us to do less manipulating on the night. We can actually set the geometry a lot easier during our two to three hour window at night. Finished product. Something we tried recently, all this waste concrete. So we talked about taking materials in, but for every tonne, two tonne of material we take in, so if we're doing three or four sleepers a night, that's four or five tonnes of waste concrete to come out. So we were taking it all out, and we've been doing it through St. Paul's and other places, or via trains. We actually put a concrete crushing plant that is the central line, 200 foot underground at a disused station called the British Museum, just outside Hoban. So we trialled it. Slight little problem, creates a bit of dust. We did have water sprays on it, but it creates a bit of dust. And the idea was we were going to use the aggregate it produced, because you can change the actual aggregate size it crushes it down to, as fill. So we're looking at recycling the product we take out. But there's a few issues on the go at the moment regarding HAC concrete to OPC concretes, so aluminum, calcides and whatever. There's a few issues about what you can and can't build with. Is that a work instruction written on the wall? What well, <laughs> being spoken to Neerwex? Yeah, I, I did think about photoshopping that, but I thought it's reality. <laughs> yeah. You should see some of them, that's the best, best angle, trust me. <laughs> That's it with my slides. Um, there's one other thing I want to say on innovation. Today, right now, I've got a team working at Aldwych disused station, so the Hoban Aldwych shuttle that used to run. And what we're trying to do is, we said about the dust that's created when we break all the concrete out, we're looking at the ways of eliminating that. So what's happening at this very moment in time, we're doing concrete bursting underground in Aldwych Station. Concrete, <coughs> if you type concrete bursting into YouTube, basically you drill some stitch holes 
and you can actually you put a, uh, a mandrel in which expands and just makes the concrete split. You can control the angles of the cracks that come in, the size of the blocks that are produced by this process. But the idea of doing some trials in a disused station, we're actually not 100% sure at this moment in time if we can utilize the process because we're a little bit worried about our steel tunnel rings, our cast iron tunnel segments. So we've got structural engineers, all sorts of engineers at this moment in time, literally now, down at Aldwych, undertaking some trials on concrete bursting. So we're always looking at different ways of working to eliminate hazards, to make life that little bit easier. I should stop there, because I've, <coughs> I've actually gone over. I promised some others I would finish early. I apologise. Sorry. Right, can I have a big round of applause?